Welcome to my guide to the 2018 Key Stage 2 SATs paper for the English Grammar, Punctuation and Spelling, also known as the SPAG test. If you've just done this paper this year, um, you might not want to do it again, I understand that. Um, if you're watching this video uh, in 2019 or, or late 2018, um, you can download the paper in the description, uh, give it a try and then come back to the video and see if you got the marks. Okay, so let's dive straight in. Number one, insert a comma in the correct place in the sentence below. Although he was the youngest, Tom was one of the tallest. Um, this bit here, although he was the youngest, it's asking to put a comma in really because you have a little pause after that. But it's also a subordinate clause. Although he was the youngest, comma, Tom was one of the tallest. Number two, which sentence must end with a question mark? So obviously we're looking for questions here. Um, what happened that day might never be known. Uh, that's not a question, that's just a statement. What really happened that day? Well, that's that question, you're asking somebody that. That's one. And it says tick one, so I know that I don't need to waste any more time here. Number three, the prefix re can be added to the root word play to make the word replay. Tick the meaning of the word replay. This question is testing your knowledge of what uh, the prefixes mean. Um, you should have a good understanding of what re means. If you're not sure, what I re recommend doing is actually looking at the word and thinking, well, where have I heard that before? What, what, what's the best definition that could fit that? Um, so I, I was thinking maybe like a football match, um, the ref might watch a replay to see what happened, see if it was a, a goal or not. So if you watch it again, or to play again, that looks about right. Play the footage again. Number four, tick one box in each row to show whether the sentence is a question, a statement, or a command. Uh, we know that questions uh, would normally have a question mark on the end of them, but in this case they've removed that to make it difficult for you. Um, a statement is just a little piece of information um, or a fact, and a command is when you're being told to do something categorically. Um, so put these dishes away or make your bed, etc. So looking at this first one here, in autumn many trees lose their leaves. Well, that's a fact, just a bit of information, so it's a statement. Look at the trees carefully. Well, you're being told to do something. Look at the trees carefully. So it's a command. Scientists are studying how trees can live for thousands of years. Again, it's just another snippet of information. It's a statement or a fact. How can you tell a tree's age? Well, that's a question you would ask somebody who is interested in trees. Number five says add two commas to the sentence below to make it clear that Anna has four favourite things. Um, it's just checking your knowledge of commas in a list by the looks of things. Anna's favourite things are camping, holidays, cycling and swimming. Because it's a list, we need a comma after all these, these nouns here. Anna's favourite things are camping, comma, holidays, comma, cycling and swimming. Now, because there's an and here, we don't put a comma. Uh, it does say add two as well, so uh, that's the answer. Number six says tick the adverb in the sentence below. You should know that an adverb describes a verb. It tells us where, when, where or how something is happening. Um, the lively crowd cheered loudly when the rally car race began. So I did say before it's describing a verb, so that's an action word, a doing word. Um, in this case, one of the action words here is cheered, so they are doing something, they're cheering. And this is describing the word cheered loudly. So this one here is the adverb, because it's describing the verb. Number seven says insert a pair of commas in the correct place in the sentence below. Um, by the looks of things, this is a relative clause. It has a relative clause in it. So my father, who works at the museum, gave my class a guided tour. Relative clauses always start with a relative pronoun, which is in this case is who. There are a few of them. There's who, which, and that, and a few more. Um, so the first thing to look for is a relative pronoun. And we have one here, my father, who. So we have a comma here. My father, who works at the museum, comma, gave my class a guided tour. This is this extra bit of information. It's relative to the father here. So my father, who works in the museum, gave my class a guided tour. Um, relative clauses are always surrounded by the commas, so it's important that you know that. Number eight is testing your knowledge of standard English and punctuation. Which sentence is grammatically correct? So let's look through them. Some of them are really obvious that so they're not correct, and others are a little bit tricky. You've just got to uh, narrow them down. Okay, so the first one says, tomorrow we went shopping at the sales. Tomorrow's in the future tense, and we went is in the past, so that doesn't make sense. Uh, tomorrow we went shopping in the sales, so it's not that one. In three weeks' time, I will be on holiday. 
this uh, apostrophe is put in there, I think, to try and to try and make you think that it's not correct because uh, the fact that it's at the end means it's a plural possessive. But it is actually correct because in three weeks' time, the time is almost belonging to the weeks. In three weeks' time, I will be on holiday. The tense is the same. There's no uh, funny tense change. Um, so I'm thinking it could be that one, but we'll go through the last two and we'll see if that one's correct. Next week weekend, we had gone to the river to fish. That's the same problem again. That's in the future. We had gone is in the past, so it doesn't make sense. Last summer, we swim at the beach and collect seashells. We swim is present and last summer is, pe is past, so that one's not right either. So it is this one here. In three weeks' time, I'll be on holiday. Okay, number nine says, which verb is a synonym of the verb produce? There's always a question like this in a SATS paper. It's either a synonym or an antonym question. Um, a synonym means a word that means exactly the same um, as the word it's asking you to find. So the word produce, we're looking for a word that means produce. Um, and it says tick one. So we have make, buy, sell, or trade. And if you produce something, you are making something. So it is that one there. Number 10, which sentence is a command? And we discussed this previously that a command is telling you to do something. Um, there's no option really, it's telling you and that's the end of it. You should bring a coat. Um, that's not really telling us to do something, that's giving you a recommendation. You will need a coat in case it rains. That's sounding a bit more like it. I am going to bring a coat or bring a coat in case it rains. Well, this one, there is no option. It is you are bringing a coat. Bring a coat in case it rains. So therefore, that's the command. Number 11 is uh, testing your knowledge of prefixes and your knowledge of spelling as well. It's asking you to match the prefixes to the correct word. So looking at this one here, im. Im, correct, and it's not im. Immature, that's the one there, immature. It's check, checking your knowledge of spelling, really. Um, incorrect, it's the opposite of correct. Um, en fortune or enable, enable, and misfortune. Number 12, which option completes the sentence in the past perfect? If you're looking for uh, the past perfect, it always has a had in it because it was in the past tense. Um, so th there's only one answer that has one there and it's had set. Just to be sure, put it back in and read it. Soon after a Frenchman had set the first land speed record, it was broken. And that sounds correct. Number 13, which sentence is written in standard English? These are my favourite because they're always a bit of a laugh. Some of them sound absolutely ridiculous, like you're in a Yorkshire accent. Uh, and others sound correct, and that's obviously the one that we're going to go for. Uh, there's only one that we're looking for, which sentence. So let's see if we can find it. Two sports teams come to our school yesterday. Um, come to our school yesterday is a mix of tenses again, so that one's not right um, because it should be two sports team came to our school yesterday. My friend was tidying the classroom. That's sounding pretty good to me. Today the children done their school play. Uh, nope, that's not right. So it doesn't make any sense. The teachers was going to send a letter next week. Again, uh, that doesn't make any sense. Um, we were looking for this one here. My friend was tidying the classroom. That's the correct use, uh, use of the word was. Tick the sentence that uses a dash correctly. When I'm looking for dash questions, I always try and put a pause in there. And um, if it sounds right, it's, it normally is. So I find baking tricky. There are too many things to go wrong. That sounds pretty good. I find baking tricky. There are too many things to go wrong. Doesn't sound right at all. I find baking tricky. There are too many things to go wrong. That sounds like Siri is it saying that. I find baking tricky, there are too many things to go wrong. Um, yep, so that's pretty obvious that that's the first one. I find baking tricky, there are too many things to go wrong. Number 15 is checking your knowledge of clauses and phrases and adverbials. What is the grammatical term for the underlying part of the sentence? Well, looking at that bit that's underlined, it says Charlie spilt his juice. Um, it isn't an adverbial. It doesn't tell us when, where, or how he spilled his juice. It just tells us that he does. Um, a main clause, well, a main clause is something that can survive on its own. It makes sense by itself. And that does make sense by itself. Charlie spilled his juice. So it's more than likely going to be that one. But let's have a look at the next two. A noun phrase, well, a noun phrase is a group of words that describe a noun. Um, and it doesn't do that. The noun is Charlie and juice. We haven't got any description at all. 
So that is not a noun phrase. And the last one, a subordinate clause, is, is the reverse of a main clause, if you like. It's the bit that doesn't sound correct by itself, doesn't make sense. It needs the main clause to survive. And that's actually the bit after the underlined bit, the bit that says, but it didn't go on his shirt. That doesn't make sense, but it does make sense when we include the main clause, which is the answer, Charlie spilt his juice. Number 16, which sentence must not end with an exclamation mark? Looking at the options then, we have what a hilarious film that was. Um, normally, exclamations do start with what or how, but not always, So, but this one does need an exclamation mark. What a hilarious film that was. Um, so it's not that one. I loved the opening scene. I'm guessing this person's really into it, so he would have had an exclamation mark at the end. Let's put them in. Was the ending funny? He's asking somebody that. That's a question mark. I have never laughed so much! Exclamation mark. So it's this one here. The one that doesn't end in exclamation mark is this one. Was the ending funny? Number 17 says insert a colon in the correct place in the sentence below. We put a colon in to link two pieces of information together when they're relative. So there are two places that I have always wanted to visit, the Arctic and Antarctica. It also um, feels like there should be a pause in there as well in the, where, where we put the, col the colon. And reading it again, there are two places that I have always wanted to visit, colon, the Arctic and Antarctica. This bit of information here, the Arctic and Antarctica, links back to the sentence we've already had. Which sentence uses the underlined word as a noun? Well, a noun is a, pe a person, a place, or a thing, or an object. So let's have a look to see which sentence uses these words as either of those things. So, a dancer must be very fit. Um, that is an adjective. It's describing how a dancer should be. They must be fit. Can I help you with that jigsaw? Well, helping somebody is a doing word. It is a verb. We heard thunder, but we did not see any lightning. Well, thunder is a thing, so therefore it is a noun. The ocean is grey and angry looking today. Grey is describing the ocean, so it is an adjective. So our answer is this one here. Number 19 says, which sentence is punctuated correctly? In this case, by the looks of things, uh, we have fronted adverbials that need commas after them. Uh, it's checking your knowledge of commas. So looking at the first one, lately, Comma, the days have been growing noticeably longer and, comma, warmer. Lately the days, comma, have been growing noticeably longer and warmer. Lately the days, comma, have been growing noticeably longer, comma, and warmer. Lately, comma, the days have been growing noticeably longer and warmer. Now, you need to remember that we always put a comma after the front of the adverbial. Um, that's describing when, where, or how something's going on. Um, and there are two examples where that's punctuated correctly. That's this one here, lately, comma, the days have been growing noticeably longer, and this one here, lately, comma. However, if we look at these two examples here, this one has a problem with it, and it's this comma here. We never, ever, ever have a comma next to the word and. Lately, the days have been growing noticeably longer and, comma, warmer. There's no need for the comma there, so that one isn't correct. So as a process of elimination, this one is correct. Lately, we've used the front of adverbial correctly, and there's no other random commas in there. It's been punctuated correctly, so that's the answer. Number 20, it says, explain how the modal verb changes the meaning of the second sentence. Well, a modal verb tells me how likely something is going to happen. Uh, so it's a word such as should, or might, or will. It tells us whether or not it's going to happen. So looking at the first sentence, it says Yusuf and his sister go swimming with their dad. The second one says Yusuf and his sister might go swimming with their dad. So in your answer, really, you're looking to explain that now that the word might is in there, it's a possibility that they might go swimming, but they also might not. Whereas in the first one, it says that Yusuf and his sister go swimming, and it's almost like that's inevitable. It happens all the time. So this second sentence, you need to explain that now that the word might is in there, um, it's likely that they, they could, but they could also not go swimming. I'm not going to write that in uh, just for the sake of time, but if you explain it in that sort of way, it should be absolutely fine. Number 21 is checking your knowledge of different word classes. Which word class is the underlined word in the sentence below? Uh, my brother thinks that football is an amazing game. 
In this case, it's the determiner because it tells us a bit of information about the noun and the amazing game, the noun phrase. It tells us that there's only one of them, an. It's a quantifying determiner. Um, usually words like a, the, and an are the most common determiners. And in this case, it is correct. Number 22 says, insert a subordinating conjunction to show that we ate lunch and listened to music at the same time. Well, a subordinating conjunction, uh, there is a handy list actually of them online and I think the best place to look is if you type in a white bus subordinating conjunction. It's like a uh, acrostic poem of all the different uh, examples of subordinating conjunctions. Uh, so let's have a look, see what we can put in. We listened to the music, something we ate our lunch. Right, well, if we put and in there, we listened to the music and we ate our lunch, it would make sense. However, and is not a subordinated conjunction, it's a coordinating conjunction. Um, and if you were to look at your list of subordinating conjunctions, the best one to go in there probably is while. We listened to the music while we ate our lunch. Number 23, complete the sentence below with a noun formed from the word, the verb invent. The engineer thought her latest something would solve the problem. Um, if we look at the word invent, we could make a few words out of that. Um, the best one that's a noun is an invention. You've got to make sure that you spell these correctly, otherwise you may not get the mark. And see if it makes sense. The engineer thought her latest invention would solve the problem. It does make sense. Number 24, replace the underlying words with the correct pronoun. Write one pronoun in each box. When Jack's grandmother came to stay, she gave Jack some money. Now we've already mentioned Jack, so we could put him in there. Jack used his money to buy a game called Gables. Jack could not wait to get home and play the new game. Now, again, we've mentioned Jack before, so we can say he. He used his money to buy a game called Gables. Jack could not wait to get home and play the new game. Now we've mentioned the game as well, so it obviously doesn't have a gender, so it's it. Number 25 says, which sentence is the most formal? And a clue to looking for formal and informal sentences is that if your sentence is formal, it will more than likely not have a contraction in it. And what I mean by that is words like shouldn't, isn't, didn't, wasn't, um, they would, they would extend them to the, the form that they should be like was not or did not. Um, looking at these examples then, the first one here, watching too much television should be avoided. Um, that certainly sounds very formal, but let's have a look at the other ones. You shouldn't watch too much TV. Now the fact it's called TV is an abbreviation and shouldn't, it says to me that it's not formal. Watching lots of TV, they've done it again, isn't a good idea and isn't is a contraction, so we don't want that one either. You really should try not to watch loads of telly. That isn't too bad until we get to the end where it says loads of telly, which is quite, uh, you know, slangy as if you're talking to your mates, so that's not the right answer. So in this case, it's the first one here. Watching too much television should be avoided. Number 26, Jane wants to know if the band is playing at the festival. Write the question she could ask to find out. Remember to punctuate your sentence. So that's, that means uh, we need a capital letter and we need a question mark at the end, otherwise you won't get the mark. Um, so Jane wants to know if the band is playing. So uh, quite simply, capital I, is the band playing at the festival? Now you need a question mark at the end. And really, the best option is just to keep it as simple as possible. Number 27 says, underline the subject of the sentence below. Uh, the subject is who the sentence is about. So the tightrope walker carried a balancing pole. Um, the tightrope walker is who the sentence is about. So he is the subject. The tightrope walker. Number 28 says, write the name of punctuation that could be used instead of the commas in the sentence below. So looking at this sentence below here, it says, somehow after much swaying and rocking, the tightrope walker managed to regain his balance. Um, this bit here, after much swaying and rocking is the bit that we're asked to change. Um, what could we put here instead of commas? Um, this is an example of something we call parentheses. Um, so you could 
put dashes um, or you could put brackets. So I'm going to go for brackets. Either way, it still makes sense. Number 29 says circle the most formal option in each box below to complete the invitation. So we discussed previously about uh, what formal means. Um, it's basically speaking like the Queen, incredibly posh. Um, we would like to invite you to a catch up or get together. They both sound quite informal. Uh, so celebration is the one we would go for. Uh, to mark this fab, really cool, momentous occasion. Now fab and really cool um, definitely do not sound formal, so momentous is the one we should go for. And finally, it will start up or kick off or commence at 5pm. Commence is the most formal of those three. Number 30 is asking us to tick uh, the box to show whether it's singular or plural. And in this case, they all are using apostrophes. So the trick with singular and plural um, apostrophe use for possession is that if you've got a plural, the apostrophe nine times out of ten goes at the end after the S. So for example here, the customer's apostrophe, that's, that's telling us that there's more than one customer whose hunger was satisfied by the pizza. And because we know this fact about the apostrophes, we know that that is plural. The next one, the princess, apostrophe S, slippers were made of glass. Because this is apostrophe S, it's not princess es apostrophe, it is one princess, therefore it's singular. And the last one, those are the boys' books. Now the apostrophe is at the end, so that should tell us that it is plural. Number 31 is asking you to look at the word class for each underlined word. Um, so Joseph has beautiful writing, or well, beautiful is describing the noun of uh, his writing, uh, so therefore it is an adjective. And this one here, Joseph writes beautifully. Well, it's describing how he writes. It's describing the verb here, write. Writes is the verb. So therefore, it is an adverb. Number 32, again, is talking about uh, formality of sentence. So which sentence is the most formal? Looking at the options, we have, she suggested that her mother be present. That certainly does sound formal. She really hopes to be ready on time. Uh, there's a bit less so there. Don't forget to lock the door. Uh, not too formal, really. And if Johnny's late, we'll start without him. Well, that bottom one is definitely not formal because we can see um, your use of apostrophes for contraction and possession. And just like this one here, that's also use of apostrophe. As we discussed previously, if you see a lot of apostrophe use for contraction, uh, it's more than likely not going to be formal. Uh, so this first one here, she, she suggested that her mother be present. It's definitely formal. Number 33 says circle the four prepositions in the sentence below. Um, and a preposition really tells you where something is in relation to other things. So let's have a look uh, for an example. On a mountain bike, you can cycle across rocky ground, along muddy paths and over harsh terrain. Uh, so on is one here because it tells us where you are in relation to this. You're on a mountain bike, okay? You can cycle across the rocky ground. That's also a preposition. Um, along muddy paths and over harsh terrain. Those are the four prepositions in that sentence. Number 34 says insert one hyphen and one comma in the correct places in the sentence below. Um, so typically when we're looking for inserting a hyphen, we're looking for um, a noun then a verb. So man eating or um, in this case it's ballroom dancing because that's how they're typically used. Um, and commas, in this case, it's going to be for a list. So my grandmother is a ballroom dancing champion, comma, poet and singer. Number 35, again, it's asking you to explain how the position of the apostrophe changes the meaning in the second sentence. So looking at the first sentence, it says, what are your brother's favourite toys? Now, we discussed previously that the apostrophe dictates whether it's singular or plural. So in that first one, it says, what are your brother, apostrophe S, favourite toys? So it's talking about one brother. So assuming this person who's been asked the question only has one brother. So what's your brother's favourite toys? In the second one, it says, what are your brother's apostrophe favourite toys? So it's talking about more than one. So this person who's been asked the question has more than one brother. So 
in order to explain this, you'd say something along the lines of, in the first example, um, it's asking somebody what their only brother's favourite toy is. In the second example, it's asking um, what his many brother's favourite toys are. Explaining clearly that the second one has an apostrophe after the S, so it's plural. So the second one is asking uh, what the many brothers' favourite toys are, because it's plural. As long as you get that bit of information in, that will get you the mark. Number 36, which two sentences use punctuation to show parentheses? So we've discussed that um, for parentheses, you ideally need a dash or brackets or commas. Um, so there's two examples here. The first one, there are some books, including storybooks, in the cupboard. Now, that one uses dashes correctly, gives us a bit of extra information here. That's one of them. To make space, comma, we moved the chairs, tables, and the boxes of games. That's not an example. That's just um, a full sentence with a bit of a list. Our classroom at the end of the corridor has a red door. Now, this one is an example because our classroom, this is the extra bit of information for the for the classroom, our classroom at the end of the corridor, and it's see how it's surrounded by commas, it has a red door. So that is the other example. Number 37 says underline the relative clause in each sentence. Well, for a relative clause to be a relative clause, it has to start with a relative pronoun. And there are a few examples of those, and just Google relative pronouns, and there's, there's not that many, so it's useful just to learn them off by heart. Um, so looking at the sentence here, all my eyes went straight for the relative pronoun so that I can see where it starts. The first one, the relative pronoun, is that. So we visited the fun fair, that came to our town. That's the relative pro the relative clause here. This one here, uh, my eyes went to who? My uncle, who lives in Australia, has sent me a present. That's the relative clause. And the other relative pronoun in this last sentence is whose. My friend, whose rabbit I look after that's the relative clause, is on holiday. Number 38 is quite a straightforward question, really. Rewrite the underlined verbs in the simple past tense. So, during the winter months, the sun did not appear high in the sky, and the days were much shorter than the nights. Really simple. Number 39 says, what's the grammatical term for the underlined words in the sentence below? Um, now, looking at it, it's describing a noun, and the noun in this case is the pencil case. And it's a load of extra information describing the noun, isn't it? A fluffy green pencil case with a gold zip. Now, because it's a group of words describing a noun, we call that a noun phrase. Number 40 says, tick one box in each row to show whether the sentence is written in the active or the passive. A good clue to start uh, looking for active or passive questions is to look for the word was because was seems to crop up a lot in the passive ones. So looking at the first one here, it says the lost dog was found by the children. The dog didn't do anything. The children were the people who did something. So the dog was being passive. Everyone heard the thunder. Well, everybody's doing something there. They're all listening. So that's active. Now this last one here is trying to catch you out. I know I said previously that they typically have the word was in there. Um, however, Nicole is the subject of this sentence. She is actually doing something. Whereas in this first one here, the lost dog, that was the subject, the lost dog. Um, he didn't do anything. He was just found by the children. So the children were the ones doing the action. So he was passive. In this case, Nicole was riding her bike. It's in the past tense. But Nicole is doing something. Her bike's not doing any of the work. She is riding the bike. So therefore, it is active. Number 41 says, rewrite the sentence below as direct speech. Remember to punctuate the sentence correctly. So we're looking for speech marks, inverted commas, um, and punctuation at the end to make sure it's correct. So looking at this sentence here, it says, I asked her if she needed any help. Um, so if you imagine that you are asking somebody if they need help. So I asked, you need your inverted commas, capital letters start the speech, do you need any help? We need the question mark inside the inverted commas and that's the end of the sentence. Number 42 says circle the possessive pronoun in the sentence below. We know a pronoun is things like I, you, he, she, but a possessive pronoun 
is when you are attaching a belonging to somebody. So that would be mine, um, that's his, that's hers, it belongs to those people. So looking for an example here, it's just one, uh, the answer is mine, you know where mine were. Number 43, rewrite the two sentences below as one sentence using an appropriate coordinating conjunction. So um, coordinating conjunctions, there are a good list of them. If you type in this word here, fanboys, into Google, you get a list of all the appropriate coordinating conjunctions. So F is for, A is and, N is nor, B is but, O is or, Y is yet, and S is so. So we're looking for uh, one of these to be used. So looking at this one here, we have time to play a game. Um, so a good one to use here looks like but. So we have time to play a game. So because we split these two sentences into one, we're going to need to have a comma in there. We have time to play a game, comma, but we will, I'm not going to write the rest, we will have to finish it before dinner, full stop at the end. Number 44, underline the adverbial in the sentence below. So uh, an adverbial tells us when, where or how uh, something is happening. So if you look here, Felix has a dental appointment. Um, and if you were to ask him when he has it, it would be on Wednesday. So that is the adverbial there. They always end in commas as well. So that's another clue. Number 45, circle the relative pronoun in the sentence below. Remember I said that there's a list of relative pronouns. Just Google them. There's not that many to look for, um, but they're quite easy to remember. For example, there's one here, who. And this is how our, our relative clause starts. So the boy who knocked on our door, comma, was at the wrong house. Um, but in this case, it's just asking us to show you where the relative pronoun is, and it's who. Number 46, add a suffix to the words in the boxes to complete the sentence. So, looking at the verb here, it's equal. Our school believes in equal something for all pupils. Now, a suffix is something that goes on the end of the word to change its meaning. Um, and in this case, the word would be equality. Our school believes in equality for all pupils, so the suffix is Itty, I-T-Y, that's gone on the end of there. Looking at the next one, we took addition, something, clothing, in case it turned cold. Um, and in this case, it would be additional. You've got to make sure you spell things correctly, especially if they've given you the first bit. Uh, if you make any mistakes on there, they could. They might be cruel enough to not give you the mark, so really be careful with those. Number 47 says circle each word that should begin with a capital letter in the sentence below. Now the fact it says each word means that there are more than one of them. So looking for the obvious ones first. All starts of sentences need a capital letter. So this one here. Um, the island called Zanzibar. Well Zanzibar is a place, a proper noun. It needs a capital letter. Um, is in the Indian Ocean. Now Indian Ocean is a place. So both of these need capital letters, off the coast of Africa. Now, Africa is obviously a place too, so that needs a capital letter. So there are five answers in this question. Number 48 says circle the four verbs in the passage below. So a verb is an action word or a doing word. So there were hundreds of gulls circling in the sky. They gathered near the dock searching for scraps. Now it says there's four. We know that gathered is definitely one because they're doing something. Circling is definitely one. Um, they are doing something there, they're going around in circles. And the last one is searching for scraps. So searching is, uh, they're doing something, they're looking for something. Now, the one that catches people out is this one here. It's the word were. Um, is and am and to be, they are verbs that are often overlooked. So the fact that there were hundreds of girls, they are there, they are being, so therefore it's a verb. That that's the one that they always throw in to try and catch you out. Number 49 says rewrite the underlined verb in the sentence below so it's in the present progressive. If it's in the progressive, we are looking for an am or a were or a was in there. Now the fact that it's present means it's going to be am, okay? So if we change the word taught into teaching, um, that's another thing we need. And if it's progressive, we need it, the verb to end in ing. Um, so you would change the sentence to I am teaching 
my sister to skateboard. Right, we've made it to the last question. Underline the subordinate clause in the sentence below. Now remember that the subordinate clause cannot survive by itself. It doesn't make sense without the main clause. So Hassan and I are going to our dance class. Well, that makes sense. That wouldn't be out of place by itself. We are going to be late as we missed the bus. So in this case, the bit that doesn't make sense by itself is as we missed the bus. Um, Hassan and I are going to our dance class, makes sense. We are going to be late, also makes sense. As we missed the bus, doesn't make sense by itself. Therefore, it's the subordinate clause. I hope you found that video helpful and uh, I hope that you've done really well and you've aced the test. That's fantastic if you have. Um, if you haven't and you've got SATs this coming year, don't panic. I've got loads of videos uh, on here and on my website to help you. Um, just visit www.mrwalleducation.com and have a look there and you'll be absolutely fine. Don't panic. Please like this video and subscribe to my channel. Thanks for watching.